Yeah, welcome to our live stream. If you're new, if you haven't come before, welcome. We are the Socialist Workers' Party. We're really happy to have you. Um, my name is Leila Assam. I'm a member of the Socialist Worker Party and I'm a student at University of Bristol. But right now I'm coming at you live from South London. Uh, this event, uh, this meeting is going to be really, really, really interesting. We have two incredible speakers. We have Leo Panich, who is the co-editor of the Socialist Register. He is a distinguished research professor in political science and he is the author of the fantastic book Searching for Socialism. So welcome, Leo. Uh, and we have Alex Kalinikos, who is a leading member of the SRVP and he's the author of the brilliant book The Revolutionary Ideas of Karl Marx. So welcome everyone. Um, if you're watching please like and share, tell all your friends to come join us. We're sharing on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, so we're everywhere. I'm sure you can get lots of people to watch. This is going to be really interesting um, and let us know where you are. Let us know who you are. Say hello. Let us know where you're watching from. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so this event is Corbyn, Where Now for Labour and the Left? I think this is one of the most um, necessary conversations that we should be having right now, especially in such unprecedented times with this virus. We all know that Corbyn inspired so many people and gave a lot of hope in paving the way for a better society. Um, he lifted up so many socialist ideas to light and he really highlighted the importance of fighting for social and economic justice and equality for everyone. And after the disappointing election results, and now with Keir Starmer's taking of the Labour Party, we can see it moving significantly towards the right. And I think a lot of us are wondering what is going to happen with Corbyn's mission? How do we keep it alive, especially with this crisis of coronavirus? I think this conversation is going to be really necessary and important for everyone to listen into. So while we're live streaming, please, as always, keep liking, keep sharing. But uh, importantly, please ask us any questions you have. We really want to hear from you. Keep asking throughout the entire talk. Uh, and after we've heard from both speakers, we're going to hear from all of you guys. We're going to hear some questions. So thank you guys again for watching. Um, I'm yeah, ready to introduce our first speaker. So first, we're going to hear from Alex. Alex, please. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Leila. And thanks, thanks a lot, Leo, for participating in this discussion because it's a it's a real pre um, pleasure to be discussing with with you. Leo is a very important, a great engaged scholar of both capitalism and the labour movement, the two those two great antagonisms and uh, a very experienced observer of the left in Britain. And just a few days before the December general election, he, I watched um, a talk he gave on YouTube, which was very prescient in um, pointing to the erosion of labor support in Northern working class constituencies and therefore in predicting what alas happened in the general election. I've also uh, greatly enjoyed uh, reading uh, Leo's new book, the book he's written with his uh, long-standing co-thinker Colin Lees called Searching for, for so Socialism. And partly inspired by the book, but also just in the light of the situation that Leila has mapped out for us, I want to make um, three points um, in doing so, I think I'm going to say a lot of things that Leo will agree with. Um, so uh, what we're taking part is, I think, a, dis a discussion among people who share very similar ob objectives. Uh, I think the, dis the differences that emerge are prim will primarily be ones of emphasis, but maybe also political conclusion. Okay, first of all, one of the, the great things about Leo's and Collins' book is that it puts the Corbyn experience in a much longer term perspective uh, in the history of the Labour left, not throughout the history of the party, but uh, since uh, the rise of Tony Benn in the late 60s and early, early 19, 1970s. Um, but when you, when you, what part of the virtue of giving that long-term context is it brings out how exceptional uh, what happened around uh, Cor Corbyn, both the breakthrough that he made uh, and also how it was, was crushed. 
Uh, I think that experience has confirmed what I think has been long clear about the nature of the Labour Party, that it's essentially dominated by a combination of the parliamentary Labour Party and the trade union leadership. This is a partnership which is largely cooperative, sometimes co conflictual, and the effect of that partnership is in the long term to bind Labour to the British state and to a political project at best of the humane management of capitalism. And um, the, um, the Corbyn-McDowell uh, partnership, uh, if you like the rival partnership of Jeremy Corbyn and uh, John McDonnell, was able to take control of the leadership through a window that briefly opened up in 2015 when Corbyn was elected leader. The various elements involved in that, uh, a combination, I would say, of growing impatience um, in the uh, union leaders with the uh, leadership of the Labour Party, uh, most recently uh, under Ed, Ed Miliband, um, the unintended consequences of the introduction of one member, one vote for the leadership elections, and most important understanding why it was Corbyn who benefited from this, um, uh, a broader political radicalization, mainly a young, among young people, provoked by the experience of crisis and austerity. And Corbyn was the political expression of that radical, radical, radicalization. Um, the defeat of Labour in December, and now Starmer's takeover of the Labour leadership, represents the closing of that window. Um, I would say the decisive, you know, what was crucial in closing that window? The most important single thing is the role played by the right wing of the Labour Party, based not simply in the parliamentary party, but now we know through the revelations recently, in the Labour Party apparatus it, itself against Corbyn in alliance with the mainstream media. I mean, Labour's had a lot of witch hunts in its history, but this is the first time in which central elements of the party have witch hunted their own leader. And one slight criticism I have of Leo and Colin's book is that they don't make enough of the anti-Semitism campaign. Um, they say rightly that the accusations of Corbyn are being an anti-Semite uh, absurd and without any basis. But I think that that campaign, however absurd it was, was crucial in undermining uh, Corbyn's um, public position. And what made that campaign so effective the way, was the way in which it was often articulated and certainly amplified by Labour parliamentarians them, the, the, themselves. That gave it a credibility that I think gravely weakened mm -hmm. Corbyn's position and was reinforced by his own failure to fight back in the only way in which he could, um, which might not have worked, but if he'd said consistently, I'm being accused of being an anti-Semite because I stand with the Palestinian people against Israeli oppression, then at least he would have an answer, but there was very little answer. Um, the other factor, of course, uh, and here the Labour right uh, of great culpability was the disastrous decision um, to uh, campaign for a second referendum on Brexit. And what a good idea it is to have the architect of that disastrous decision as leader of the Labour Party. So that's my first point. The second point is I think that the class struggle uh, is absolutely central to understanding what happened. And you can see this in two ways in particular. On the, on the one hand, you have um, the legacy of past defeats above all the defeat of the miners' strike in 1984-85. Uh, it's a bit like, you know, the light from stars that take, you know, uh, many years sometimes, sometimes thousands of years to, to, to reach, reach us. That great terrible struggle and its defeat continues to, um, to, to make itself felt on the contemporary left and labor movement. In the, in the way in which those ex-mining seats fell into the Tory camp in, in, in December. 
a consequence not simply of the defeat and the suffering that that caused, but also the neglect of those constituents constituencies consistently by both Tories and, and, and Labour, a reflection of the broader class, class bias is a weak way to put it, that we see operative in our society very obviously in the COVID-19 pandemic. On the other hand, the class struggle is present, sorry, this is too dialectical a way of putting it, but it's present in its relative absence during the Corbyn period. Leo and Colin show very well the extent to which the Ben movement around Ben in the 70s and 80s was an expression of a broader social and political radicalization, the 60s, the movements that came out of 68 and so on, but crucial as the kind of, particularly in Britain, as the driver of that, the great upsurge of working class militant See that destroyed the government of Ted Heath in the uh, in the early, early 19, 1970s, and therefore, in understanding why Ben is ultimately defeated, Thatcher's success in crushing the the very militant groups of workers that had destroyed Heath's, Heath's government is 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 critical. But in the Corbyn period, the period in which he's leader. The class struggle is at a very low ebb. Uh, Corbyn famously was the great MP of the movements, but still and still will be now that he's been released from his burden of, uh, of Labour leader. But nevertheless, under his leadership, those movements were comparatively weak. You have the phenomenon of don't fight in the present, wait for Corbyn, something that is greatly reinforced of course, by the trade union leaders who love to say, wait for, wait for Labour to save us and to, to release us from the responsibility of doing our, doing our jobs. The we, one, of, one of the main weaknesses, I mean, let me say, I'm saying critical things of Corbyn, but I think he's, I mean, he's my own MP. I think he's an absolutely admirable figure who's done great work over the years and who did great things as leader of the Labour Party. But one of the weaknesses of his leadership was that he didn't consistently go out to encourage and promote mass activity on the streets and in the workplace, in the workplaces. And this is linked to something else, which is the weakness of the Labour left. Because uh, one of the things that Leo and Colin do in their book is doc document the long period of... Um, dominance of Labour by the right, above all, under Blair and, and Brown. During that time, as they show, the hard Labour left, people like Corbyn and Macdonald, are completely marginalised. And they have very little activist base. Now, you can't build an organised base overnight. I mean, the momentum is, in some ways, a very impressive achievement. You know, any revolutionary organisation would kill for... For, sorry, that's probably not the best way of putting it, would love to have 40,000 40, members. But if you look at what Momentum did with that base, it was it focused on two area, areas. Winning, trying to win the inner party struggle against the right wing and organizing canvassing in the elections of 2017 and 2019. What it didn't, what... Um, what it didn't do was to throw itself into building broader movements and struggle, struggles, solidarity with the strikes that did take place and so, so on and so forth. Involvement in particular in the anti-racist struggle that we know has become so, so important uh, in the past few years here as, as, as elsewhere. And this points to a dilemma that faces Labour activists, which Leo and Colin uh, talk about in there book, but I think it's worth underlining, is, okay, you organize as uh, a socialist inside the Labour Party. What is your focus on? Is it on waging the inner party struggle, or is it on building the broader str social struggles and movements that are the real source of the left's power? Left's power? And that dilemma is unresolved. Okay, let me come to my last point. Um, which is the, 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 the legacy of Corbyn. Where do we go, on, go, from, 
go from here. The most important legacy of Corbyn is the transformation of Labour, the recreation of Labour as a, as a mass party uh, with a, a greatly increased membership, but in a different situation from past moments in which Labour was a mass party, with a much weaker organised working class, with the Labour Party um, not having the kind of organic roots in working class communities that it did now quite a long time ago, but that it did undoubtedly in the, uh, in the past. That's not to deny the importance of the, in a certain way, the return of the radical left to Labour. You know, what we see in the past few years under Corbyn is a reinvestment in the Labour Party by um, many activists who had abandoned it in the Brown and, uh, and Blair era, or uh, who had indeed been active in various attempts to build alternatives to, to Labour. There's this surge back, back to, to Labour, and then there's this influx of a new generation of, of left um, into, into the Labour Party. The question is, so the, as hasn't been true for a long time, the majority of the active left in Britain are in the Labour Party again. The question is, what do they do now? They're confronted with a leadership which is moving fast to the right, you know, Starmer, all the talk of trying to carry on the Corbyn legacy and so on, that's clearly going to go. He's presenting himself as a loyal uh, critic, uh, but emphasis on the loyal on the whole of Boris Johnson and, and so, so on and so forth. Um, what do they do? What do all these activists do in the face of that leadership? We come back to the dilemma I've already talked about. Do you focus as a left-wing activist in the Labour Party primarily? You know, of course you can try and do both, but uh, the, one of the great leaders of the left in the Labour Party, uh, Nye Bevin, said that the language of priorities is the religion of socialism. You have to decide what you're going to prioritise. Do you prioritise building the struggle or winning the, 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 the battle or advancing, because you can't win in the short term, that's clear, advancing the battle inside, inside, the, inside the Labour Party. And uh, I think, of course, uh, Leo can, and I'm sure will say, okay, you're saying don't work in the Labour Party, build the left outside the Labour Party, of course, I would say, build the SWP, but look at the, um, the record, both of attempts to build alternatives to Labour and of building the revolutionary left in, in recent years. Not simply in this country, but if we also if we look elsewhere, the attempts in particular to build electoral alternatives further to the left are not very spectacular, to say the least. This is undeniable. And I think we have to say that the whole experience of the missed opportunities for the left of the 60s and 70s, and then the defeats of the subsequent uh, generation have deeply scarred the left, both reformist and, and, and revolutionary. And we shouldn't ignore our own responsibility in this, uh, um, the, the, the mistakes that we've made and, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, it's the, the, what the left has suffered is less important than the, um, uh, I'm, I'm, must be due to finish quite soon. Um, uh, oh, right. Thanks. Okay, good. Thanks for telling me. So I'll, st I'll stop very quickly. Um, the suffering of working class people in the neoliberal era is now becoming a, a horror story if we, and literally a horror, horror story if we look at the COVID-19 epidemic and the way in which this has involved what's becoming a massacre of the old uh, of uh, key workers and of uh, ethnic, ethnic mi minorities. But I think the situ to be very brief because I've spoken uh, I've reached my limit really in a where when a situation which is changing significantly with the emergence of the move 2019 was the year in which Corbyn was defeated it's also the year in which here and around the world we saw the emergence of massive 
uh, and very militant uh, movements against climate change, in which we see the entry of a new, often very young uh, generation into, into uh, essentially left, left politics in a way that is totally outside the protocols of parliament, parliamentary socialism. And um, the, even if protest has been dimmed for a minute, because of the pa pandemic. The pandemic itself is another facet of capitalism's destruction of, of, of nature. So we can expect the, the movements that begin to challenge this destruction of nature to de develop with redoubled force um, in, the, in the coming period. And I think that creates a context in which revolutionary politics can renew themselves in a way that can be attractive to many of the people who for good reasons have been attracted towards uh, towards Corbyn and his project. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Alex. That was really great. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys for keeping with us and to anyone who's new. Welcome. We're the Socialist Workers Party. We're having a really, really great discussion on Corbyn and the future of Labour and the left. Um, please keep your contributions coming. We're loving all your questions and we can keep taking questions all the way through while Leo is speaking. So yeah, welcome Leo. Thanks Leila uh, and thanks Alex. Uh, those were, I think, very interesting and, and uh, important comments. Uh, you know, the book ends with, I think, the sentence that uh, we need to, socialists will need to find new political forms uh, in the 21st century, if we are to be able to transcend uh, this increasingly irrational, as well as illegalitarian, inegalitarian capitalism. Uh, the question is, what are those political forms? And I, I uh, feel uh, that uh, neither the attempt to change the Labour Party, nor the attempt to found new Leninist organizations, successive to the Stalinist ones, uh, uh, have proven to be a success. So in terms of us having a useful strategic discussion, uh, I think we need to be addressing the limits of both of those as uh, we've been able to observe them uh, really over the last 50 years, which is what the book covers, over the last half century. Um, so, so let's go back to this. Um, it was already clear to... Uh, people in the 1960s, at the time that the new left was formed, at the time of the explosion of the movements that created the women's liberation movement, the gay liberation movement, uh, the massive anti-war, anti-Vietnam war demonstrations, etc. That both the capital C communist parties, uh, under the umbrella of uh, Soviet communism, uh, and the social democratic parties had run their course as agents of transformative change. And uh, socialists of that generation, uh, most creatively, I think, uh, took two paths. One path was to try to refound on a new basis a better Leninism. Uh, an internationalist one, one free of uh, the, the Stalinist deformation. Uh, the other uh, was to be drawn into the Labour Party, not in association with the old Tribunite left, which was very parliamentarist and suspicious of the 1960s movements, but rather a new left in the party, which attempted to bring the spirit of those movements and yes, the militancy 
of uh, the wildcat unofficial strikes by young workers uh, in the 1960s and 70s into the Labor Party, to, to reinvent the Labor Party with that spirit. I uh, have to say that I have spent my life in the terrible position of thinking that both of those strategies were bound to fail. Um, the first article I ever published in the Socialist Reg Register was a critique of an article by Ken Coates, himself a Trotskyist who'd been expelled from the Labor Party in 1965. Uh, who had founded the Institute for Workers' Control and was a very close ally of Tony Benz and had written an article in the Register called Socialists in the Labor Party saying, where have you seen a new mass party form? Aren't we better off going in to try to turn the Labor Party into a party of socialist transformation? And the essay I wrote ended with, uh, you know, tried to show the limits of that, looking, on the, looking at the practice and the limits uh, through the 1970s of the attempt to change the party. This was even before the success of any of the reforms that were passed at the party conference in 79 and 80 and 81, and said, this is bound to fail. Where have you seen the evidence of any successfully transformed social democratic party? And that proved to be right. Uh, the Labour Party was marginalized not when the miners were defeated, Alex. The Labour left in the party was marginalized by 1981 with the defeat of Ben uh, in the deputy he leadership uh, uh, contest against Healy and with an alliance between the old Labour left, Michael Foote, and the right wing, the center right, in order to uh, uh, ensure that more of the Social Democrats would not leave in order to try to stitch up uh, the divisions in the party uh, and, and marginalize the labor left. Uh, it had continued to have some life, of course, the spirit that produced it, uh, not least in the Greater London Council led by Livingston and so on, and, and by, by John McDonald. Um, but, but it was largely over by, by 1981 when Tariq Ali and Robin Blackburn applied to join the Labour Party, they weren't allowed to. Uh, they applied to join too late. It was already over uh, the attempt to transform. it. Now, the fact of the matter is that however impressive, uh, as I believe, that attempt to change the party was, uh, and however impressive so many of the cadre who engaged in trying to mobilize people in the streets very often successfully, above all through the Stop the War campaign, most impressively, but there were many other instances. Their, their attempt to found a mass party outside the Labour Party failed. And that is not unique to the SWP. That was a failure of the whole generation, everywhere. Uh, of course, there, you, know, you can say there were you know, here or there more possibilities. But we can now see, and you could see it indeed by the beginning of the millennium, that this had failed. And this is, I think, one of the tragedies of, of my generation, uh, that those of us who look to a, a new mass socialist political formation uh, that didn't happen. Uh, and I want to say it also didn't happen amongst those of us uh, who tried to found one, not based on building a better Leninism. So I, I want to be open and honest about that. And that left us in the situation by the beginning of the millennium, whereby the mass of young politicized activists uh, were anarchistically oriented were anti-party. You saw a resurgence in that sense of an anarchist sensibility of a kind you'd not seen since the building of mass socialist parties between 1880 and 1910. Uh, and the anti-globalization protesters, uh, uh, right up to Occupy, were anti-party. 
Uh, and I fear that the XR rebellion is largely that as well, however impressive it is in the current moment. So where we're at in the 21st century is that the attempt to, there, there has been a shift from protest to politics. After Occupy, uh, I think that the protesters did realize you could protest till hell freezes over. And unless you could get into the state and transform it, you weren't going to be able to carry through a revolutionary project. Now, there were alignments in those countries where you had proportional representation. Realignments of the left have occurred. Stretching from Eurocommunists to Maoists to Trotskyists to left social Democrats who have had some success. Syriza, Podemos, Delinka, the Blocko, etc. But they are all virtually now in coalitions, in governmental coalitions at either a national or regional level with mainstream social democratic parties. The successes, and, and Syriza, which is not, has effectively been social democratized, of course, itself. Uh, through the way it approached getting into government as much as its behavior in government. Uh, so the great successes in terms of the revival of a socialist sensibility around the need for party building has ironically taken place through this resurgence in the Labour Party uh, uh, behind Corbyn. Uh, now we can tr treat it, I think, as an episode uh, and uh, the resurgence, well, not the resurgence, uh, the, the astonishing movement behind Sanders uh, to try to activate a democratic socialist movement uh, behind his candidacy for the uh, presidency. Uh, that, too, looks like it's, it has run its course, although we'll have to see. Now, where does this leave us is the big question. Uh, and, and I have to, to say that I very much hope uh, that those who will now try to learn from this experience will go beyond both the attempt to change social democracy, which does involve, as Alex said, getting trapped in an internal struggle inside the party to change it which however much those people want to change it in order to be able to activate it as a party that would mobilize outside, that would educate for socialism outside, the difficulty of the attempt to, to change it means that they exhaust themselves in a struggle to change it. At the same time, it is clear that those who have founded themselves on the Bolshevik tradition on the tradition of 1917, while, they, while people may still be inspired by the spirit of 1917, the language itself of trying to revive Bolshevism sounds arcane, and however much it may play a useful role in helping people protest, it never seems to be able to turn those people into the kind of activists who are committed in enough numbers to building a mass socialist party. This is our common experience. And this is what we need to be discussing in a non-sectarian way in terms of how to now move forward, which I think because of the experience behind Corbyn uh, and before that, the experience of Stop the War, UK Uncut, and the way in which those people came into the party, uh, the way in which 40,000 people have joined Momentum, the way in which 60,000 people are now in the Democratic Socialist of America, which, you know, before Sanders in 2015 had some 8,000 members of an average age of over 60. It now has 60,000 members with an average age of under 30. The question now, what becomes of this? And I do think that those of us who are long in the tooth need to finally move beyond 
trying to reconstruct the Bolshevik strategy and trying to reconstruct uh, an attempt to change social democracy as the end point of politics. I don't think it's possible to imagine right now, and Alex wasn't saying so, that the majority of those people who were mobilized behind Corbyn, even those who joined Momentum, are activists in the world transformed and so on, are about to leave the Labour Party. Uh, they're not. That's not on the agenda at the moment. So a great deal of, of, of what we need to look at in terms of how to move forward will depend on what they now do. Will they turn momentum into the kind of organizing and educating uh, organization that Alex says it has not been quite rightly? Uh, will the world transform be able to enter into those mining constituencies that Alex was talking about that do bear the scars of the legacy of the defeat of the miners. Absolutely. Right? And, and indeed, attitudes in those constituencies now very much sound like those of the Nottingham miners who were so Thatcherite during that struggle. Um, uh, you know, is it, will the level of political education that the TWT has done so impressively at Labour Party conferences uh, be able to be brought down to the level of those working class communities? There are people who want to do it. Will that lead to conflicts inside the Labour Party that will lead them to be marginalized, if not expelled? Which is possible. Uh, all these questions are now open. But I think if we're going to move forward, we also need to move forward by recognizing that while the spirit of 1917 still needs to be invoked, the uh, catalog of how to do what is to be done now, need, now needs to be transcended. I don't know where I am in my 15 minutes. Uh, do I have any time, Layla? Two minutes? Uh, I would just say in those two minutes that the problem of the organized working class, of the unions, and Alec was getting to this in terms of the partnership between the union leadership and the parliamentarist leadership, the career politicians uh, who dominate the Parliamentary Labour Party and their hacks. Uh, uh, in the party headquarters. Uh, that coalition uh, is not one that has prevented a class struggle inside the Labour Party uh, uh, many, many times in its history. Uh, and, and you saw that class struggle inside the party uh, motivating uh, uh, the attempt to change the party in the 1970s. Alex is right. But it has to be said uh, that the difference between today and the defeat of the labor left earlier was that that left-wing union leadership, which uh, was connected to the Institute of Workers Control, was encouraging the militancy, by the 1970s had turned against public sector workers. Uh, the engineering union during the winter of discontent moved to the right in hostility to the public sector workers organizing and militancy. Uh, that was the key, I believe, to the defeat of the labor left at that time. In the current situation, we have a left union leadership, which began to emerge against Blairism uh, at the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, Corbyn could never have emerged. Miliband, Ed Miliband would never have been elected, but Corbyn could never have secured the kind of material support. And indeed, one member, one vote would never have happened unless Unite and Len McCluskey in particular had backed it. Most of the labor left had opposed it. Yet the situation is that while McCluskey has played an important ideological role, at the last Labour Party conference, he, he had a, I was on a panel with him, a young Labour panel, where he turned on 150 young Labour supporters and said to them, what are you? Are you Remainers? 
Are you leavers or are you socialists? And they stood up as one person and cheered because no one speaks to them that way. Right? Nevertheless, the leadership of the union still operates in the old kind of partnership way in running the party, did under Corbyn, that Alex was talking to. They stitched up the appointment of Jenny Corby behind the, scene, Corby behind the scenes in the same old way as general secretary. There has been very little democratization inside those unions or political education. Uh, and, and that is something that needs to be put on the agenda as well. It has to be addressed. Um, so those are the kinds of issues that I think we need to be speaking to. It is not enough to go back to uh, the old SWP strategy of being good at motivating and inserting itself and often leading struggles in the streets. Uh, uh, and it, it's just not enough, however impressive the work that the SWP has done in the past and will no doubt do in the future in that respect. I'll leave it at that. Great. Thank you so much, Leo. Thank you for that. That was really great contribution. Thank you guys for keep on, uh, keeping on watching with us. We have about 600 of you live, so this is brilliant. It's really great to have you all. Um, keep liking, keep sharing. We're going to go on to some questions now. So I'm going to read out a couple of our questions. Here's a question, one from Doria, or Dora, sorry. Why has Labour not argued for public ownership of the big supermarkets and the creation of a publicly owned delivery system guaranteeing supplies for those in need? That's a question from Dora, thank you. We've also got a question from Rabia. What is going to happen with teachers returning to school on the 1st of June? And do you think the unions can win after Corbyn's defeat? Thank you, Rabia, for that question. And we have another question from Gary. In the aftermath of the leaked Labour reports and with seemingly no repercussions for those implicated, I'm really wavering. It seems neo neoliberalism is just too entrenched in the party. Why should I stay? And how can the members ever get our real party back? Thank you for all those questions, guys. Um, we're gonna hear from both speakers. Keep liking, keep sharing, tell your friends. We've still got a lot more to go. Uh, and thank you for watching. So we're gonna hear from Alex first, if you're ready. Okay, um, thanks. First of all, I want to thank Leo for a really great, uh, thoughtful present presentation of where we are at the minute and the problems that we face. <laughs> in, terms of the, in terms of the questions, um, which I think are very relevant to, to our debate, I want to focus on the first two, because I think that um, one of the things that um, Corbyn and MacDonald were relatively weak about was really pushing the argument for public ownership. In that respect, uh, Ben in the 70s was much stronger. Um, um, the, um, and I think um, we, but I think that we can see now in the situation that we're confronted with at present, where capitalism is essentially on its knees because of the pandemic and the lockdowns and so on, and is hel being held up in the state, gives a legitimacy to socialist arguments about public ownership and so on. So it's a very good question. Why doesn't Labour uh, raise these kinds of demands? The answer to it is because what we have now in charge of the Labour Party is a refurbished new Labour leadership. That's essentially what's happening under, under Starmer. Uh, however, he may try to position himself slightly, slightly differently. In terms of the teachers, uh, I mean, I think it's essential that the teachers refuse to go back to work at the um, at the at the beginning of June, um, uh, and I think that uh, they will have enormous support if they do, because you know there are more and more rev revelations of the way in which this government allowed tens of thousands of mainly elderly and vulnerable people die 
without any medical help in either care homes or indeed in their own homes. And I think that is eroding the legitimacy of this government and will strengthen the case of the teachers. Why is, th why is that relevant to what we're discussing now? Because I, th I want to emphasize what I was saying before, that we're moving into a new situation in which the class struggle, um, in which class issues are becoming much more sharply posed because of the kind of death dealing character of contemporary capitalism. I mean, it's been death dealing on a global scale in terms of poverty and starvation and disease in the global south, but now we see it death dealing in its own homelands, you know, in the US and, and Britain and so on. And I think that poses the issue of people defending their lives and so on and so forth in a, in a, in a very sharp way. And, and this c comes back to, um, this allows me to say something about one of Leo's key points, where he said, really, our generation has failed. Uh, we failed in as much as we attempted to change the Labour Party. We failed in the sense uh, of trying to build new kinds of left parties outside the traditional reformist parties. We, people like I, failed in terms of building mass re revolutionary parties. If we under, want to understand why we failed, I think it's critical to understand that you have this explosion of struggle in the 60s and 70s, mass radicalizations, huge workers' battles, and so, so on and so forth. Um, and um, in that, um, and out of the ruins of traditional social democracy and Stalinism, you get the emergence of a new left um, including new revolutionary organizations or enormously revived revolutionary organizations that suddenly discover much larger audiences, but they don't have time to build effective organizations and wi win mass working class organization, mass working class support before the, we have the counter offensive of neoliberalism beginning to assert itself in the late 19. Uh, in the late 19, from the late 1970s, 70s onwards, we ran out of time for our different projects, and that was true of all the different tendencies on the, on the left. That that beyond the particularities of our different strategies, I think was is the crucial ex explanation. Uh, time is an issue today now because of capitalism's destruction of of nature. The clock is running on climate change. The clock is running with these you know, what is probably not the first of a series of, of, of pa pandemics. But this is, a, this is a context in which I think um, it's possible to, um, to uh, renew uh, projects that seem to have been, been defeated. Maybe I'll have a chance to say more after the next round of questions, because I'd like to elaborate it. But I want to leave time for, for Leo. Right, thank you very so much. It. Thank you very much, Alex. Leo, when you're ready. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, the Corbyn team, and especially McDonald, did do very well on public ownership. Uh, one needs to remember that uh, when Labour went into opposition in 1970, after the disastrous Wilson government, uh, and the left took over the national executive, uh, uh, under Tony Benn's uh, leadership. Uh, there were 80 committees at work developing policy. 80 committees inside the party headquarters were at work developing policies with Marxist intellectuals, not only left Keynesian ones, uh, advising them, writing massive papers for them, etc. Corbyn and McDonald had nothing like this, nothing like this. There was no trace of that left. Uh, it already had been, you know, largely uh, done away with by Kinnock, and then the shift to the policy forums uh, afterwards, uh, uh, much elaborated by Blair, 
you know, it, 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 there was no capacity inside the party organization. So what happened was largely out of the McDonald's shadow chancellor office. Uh, he motivated uh, really an impressive set of studies uh, with radical people doing them around new models of public ownership. And what was good about that uh, was that McDonald himself, not so much those reports, was constantly getting at the limits of the 1945 nationalizations, above all in terms of workers' control and industrial democracy. Now, uh, what they ended up with in that respect was problematic, workers on boards, um, workers receiving a certain portion of the profits, all of which is more likely to tie workers to their particular managers uh, in unreconstructed corporations than in competition against other workers and other corporations. Uh, but I, I think what has to give, especially McDonald, considerable credit. On the other hand, I think it is true that one of the limits of the Corbin episode was their inability generally strategically to mobilize you know, the impressive intellectual capacity on the labor left and beyond in a more general way. Uh, uh, and and uh, you know that there were people who wanted to do that, attempted to do it, et cetera, but it tended to go nowhere. Uh, and I think that was one of the, the great defects in terms of program, uh, not least around public ownership. Um, in terms of whether to stay in the party, uh, look, it, it really it is largely a matter of whether momentum in the world transformed, which is the institutional legacy of the Corbin episode, can be moved to do good things. It's not a matter of looking at whether there's retribution in the party headquarters, whether Starmer whether Starmer's radicalism of the center amounts to, uh, you know, warm beans. That, that's not the issue. People shouldn't, uh, you know, put uh, any measure on this. The question is, what can you now do through momentum and the world transform, uh, which, as Alex said, are much more impressive in their size and capacity than other left organizations today? Uh, of a explicitly socialist orientation. Uh, that's the question. And then we'll have to see, you know, uh, none of the new mass parties, the, the first permanent organizations politically of the working class, of the, any subordinate class in world history that emerged in, after in the last quarter of the 19th century, none of them didn't emerge out of splits in previous formations. Not that these were engineered by interest, but just out of, you know, as, as, as Alex says, they run out of time in relation to the conjuncture in which they emerge, people go in one direction, another, and then they recoalesce. Uh, and in terms of any successful attempt to change the Labour Party, what that would mean in the long run would be that left-wing union leaders together with uh, socialists uh, at the head of the party and activists at the base, would be left with the party apparatus, while it would be the careerists, the center-right, uh, who would split away. That's what would inevitably happen. It's not a matter of going in in order to foment that. One doesn't do that. One goes in quite genuinely hoping to change the party not to grab a few people and take it off into a small revolutionary organization. That leads nowhere. Uh, but, you know, what we'll need to see is whether, given that we're going to need new political forms in the 21st century, whether these developments inside the mainstream left parties in Britain and the United States will lead to further socialist capacity building. Uh, that can take place within the framework of running on a common ticket with the Democrats or staying within the Labour Party. Eventually, it will lead to a crisis, of course. 
But the crucial question is whether you can engage, I think Alex was getting at this, and the teacher's question is about this. I'll just end with this. Whether you can engage in class formation while doing that kind of political work inside the party. Uh, uh, and, and it's a class formation, new class formation, given the way the working class has been so transformed, balkanized, in the, by the 21st century. It's a matter of class formation in what was taken to be already the formed class, i.e. the industrial working class, right? Has to be formed anew as we see in terms of what has happened in those Yorkshire and Northern communities. And one had, then can't take for granted that the teachers while we can objectively define them as working class and we can see them as militant in certain uh, elements, really are organically also part of what we would define as the working class. The teachers have always been historically uh, uh, high status in our society. Uh, they are known in the uh, in German as the Beamte, uh, uh, and and. For the process of class formation we're talking about to take place, uh, much needs to happen with those segments of the new working class, if you like, that links it in a more organic way in working class communities uh, than has yet happened. Great, thank you very much, Leo. And thank you to all of you, all 600 of you that are watching. We really appreciate your support. Keep liking, keep sharing, give us a comment. Um, yeah, we're really, really glad to have you all watching. We're going to go through another round of questions now. Um, so I'm going to read them out for you. We've got one from Rob. Rob is asking, what does the response within the Labour Party from both the left and right to the leaked report on the governance and legal unit, particularly around the weaponization of anti-Semitism, tell us about the dilemma facing the Labour left? Thank you, Rob, for that question. We've got a question from Bridget. If we're talking about new forms of organization, what would they be? Thanks, Bridget. And we've got a question from Judy. Is the state today fundamentally different in a way that renders Lenin's state and revolution obsolete? Great questions, guys. Thank you so much. Keep liking, keep sharing. We love having you. We love chatting to you. And I'm going to go to Alex now to start us off. As Leo has t targeted um, our sort of quaint um, commitment to Leninism, maybe I should say something about why I'm a Leninist, why I'm not embarrassed uh, to say I'm a Leninist. And it's nothing to do with kind of worshipping at the grave or repeating uh, religious formulae and so on and so forth. I mean, Historical experiences of working class struggle are important reference points and the October Revolution is, uh, is a key one. But my, my Leninism really comes down, I think, to, to two crucial points. First of all, and it's raised in one of the questions, um, can capitalism be reformed using uh, the existing capitalist state? And I think the answer is emphatically no. Not because I read it in State and Revolution, but because of, you know, the experience, not just of history, but of our own generation, the experience we face now. What, what they did to Corbyn is a small hint at how capitalist, the organs of capitalist power will deal with any attempt seriously to change society however in certain ways modest that a, a, a attempt might be. Secondly, if you're a revolutionary, you have to, in other words, if you think it's necessary for the working class to overthrow the state, and we can discuss the forms that revolutionary struggle would, would take, you have to be able to do two things. First of all, you have to be able to organize yourselves. And a lot of what's identified with Leninism is to do with how we organize ourselves, but you have above all to organize yourselves to relate to other people who don't agree with you. Uh, and there, there's a particular experience which I would say is associated 
not just with the Bolsheviks, but the early communist movement, the experience of the united front between reformists and revolutionaries that was tested especially in Germany under the Weimar Republic, both quite positively in the early 1930s and very negatively by the failure of either social democrats or communists to, to unite in the early 1930s in the face, face, face of Hitler. Now, I think that's, that experience is very relevant to where we are now, because I agree with Leo, a critical question is what are all those people um, who uh, rallied to the Labour Party because of Corbyn uh, and who are still there and who aren't going to leave quickly, some of whom are organised, I think, very imperfectly, but of whatever its achievements by momentum, what are they going to do? And I think the challenge for anyone who's a serious socialist is to discover ways of working with all those people without liquidating your distinctive socialist politics. That, I think that's true of Leo, actually. You know, Leo's not a Leninist, but he's someone who, um, you know, isn't a straightforward social democrat, who's very critical of social democracy, who understands all its limitations and so on. It's a challenge for him. But it's also a challenge that faces us who do see ourselves as revolutionaries. We, we are going to have to look for ways of uniting in practice with, with the people who are currently organized in, in labor. And that will have in, in, enormous importance for the future. It will have enormous importance for the future because of the kind of struggles that we're confronted with. The fight for our lives, the fight against a renewed and even more vicious racism, the anti-Chinese racism, for example, that is being um, propagated and amplified by Trump and his supporters and so, so on and so forth. These are absolutely, I would say, mortal questions that, that we confront and that the whole left is going to deal with. If we work together, the different currents, both reformist and revolutionary work together effectively, we can build something much stronger and more effective. And in the course of that struggle, we can find out how much of Leninism, how much of the experience of Bevin and Ben and, and Corbyn is, is relevant in guiding our everyday practice. Great, thank you so much, Alex. We're gonna now go to Leo for his contribution. Uh, uh, yes, I, I think it's, it's a matter of uh, transcending uh, the Leninist contribution, finally. Uh, you know, no one, uh, of course, uh, wants to dismiss various important actors and thinkers, uh, but it, it's a matter of whether one goes back to them as providing the ABCs of where we go. And in terms of the question of, is the state different? Well, it, it, you know, and even yeah, in the way one conceives what, what to do about that when one realizes that, of course, it's a capitalist state at its core. You know, when people get oriented to radical politics, if they're given the phrase smashing the state, what the heck does that mean? in the 21st century. Uh, you know, we need to be speaking, and it may have had some meaning in Tsarist Russia, uh, but the state of the 21st century uh, isn't going to be smashed. And in fact, as Lenin himself said, by 1921-22, the Bolsheviks were occupying the old state. They hadn't smashed it. Um, so you know, th these kinds of little phrases are of enormous importance. And what we, we need to get serious if we want to talk about ourselves as revolutionaries in a world in which this massive state apparatus with its repressive potential makes an insurrection so 
unlikely without a prior transformation of the mass actors in uh, the repressive apparatus. The notion of dual power is problematic, fundamentally problematic. Uh, that we are going to be able to replace the existing state with a set of organizations constructed outside of it. All of this is very problematic. And these are the building blocks of people who are impressive cadre. But when they're trying to think through forms of party organization, they begin with these building blocks and they are fundamentally problematic. Uh, it is certainly the case that the major problem of the socialist left is not, it, it comes around the, the question of implementation. Uh, it's not a matter of having better policy, more public ownership in your policy, et cetera, et cetera. And all of our debates tend to be about that. Very little work is done in terms of thinking through what it would take to transform a ministry of education, what it would take to transform uh, the health apparatus, let alone what it would take to transform the treasury uh, and, and, and the Bank of England. And so on. And one may say, we'll get rid of them. But what does one put in their place? And, and very little work has thinking goes into that. And not only a matter of what technical things would be done, but how would we address the people who work in those bodies? How would we change what they do from day to day? How would we get them to be agencies, to be cadres themselves, of building support for that transformation? That's the serious stuff. The stuff that we tend to give people, or that Leninists tend to give people, and I don't say we because Alex right, I haven't been one, uh, begins with the building blocks I was speaking of that I don't think help very much. Uh, that's not to say that uh, this means we have any sort of other building blocks for new forms of organization. Uh, this is what the new generation, Lila's generation, uh, the generation who came into the DSA who are under 30, who came into the momentum who are under 30, it will be their life's vocation to find those modes of organization. Uh, one can only hope they'll be as successful in finding those modes of organization as those who built the mass parties uh, between 1880 and 1920. Um, but it's, it is a process of discovery we're embarked on. Uh, and, and I think we need to free ourselves of some of the baggage, uh, both of the social democratic bag baggage uh, and of the Leninist baggage as we do this. Great, thank you so much, Leo. So we've had a lot of questions from you guys and they've just been too good to ignore. So we're gonna have one bonus round, but I'm just gonna limit your, both of your responses to only a couple of minutes so we can, um, yeah, so we can just keep this meeting going on time. So we have a bonus question from Mary. Thank you, Mary, for your question. Um, here it is. COVID has led to another crisis of capitalism on a bigger scale than before. What are the tasks for socialists and how do we respond? So I'm gonna to go to Leo, back to you again for only a couple of minutes, please. Theanalysis.com, an hour long interview uh, that just went up this week, this past week, uh, where I tried to address this in terms of how this exposes the irrationality of 21st century capitalism. Uh, how uh, it makes the case for democratic economic planning for us in many respects. Um, so, you know, I, rather than try to repeat that in 30 seconds, uh, I suggest people take a look at that um, uh, or listen to it rather, it's a podcast, um, and, and see if they agree. I, 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 I do think that is, as Alex was saying, 
uh, the opportunity we have as, as socialists today um, uh, discursively uh, is enormous. Um, and, and in some instances, in terms of the level of class struggle in certain places, also significant. Uh, although nothing like Alex is right, it, it was in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but I do think that we have enormous opportunity discursively. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, it isn't just a matter of discourse. It is a matter of, because this won't happen unless there is a shift in the balance of class forces on the ground. So what we're talking about in terms of new class formation, um, it, it, simple things like, you know, winning back trade union rights to engage in strikes and struggle and build membership and so on, while being very aware that without a democratization of those unions, uh, without them being engaged in profound class formation, that shift in balance of class forces isn't going to take place. Uh, so it, it isn't just a matter then of, you know, discourse and policy. It always comes back to what is done organizationally uh, to enhance the class struggle. Perfect. Thank you, Leo, for your answer. We're going to hear from Alex now. Um, I, I can't, first of all, I can't resist saying, Leo, that your last sentence is a bit like what is to be done. Um, which recalls a certain Russian book, uh, but that's a that's an ad hominem point. I think um, I mean I've said something about just what a profound and uh, life-threatening crisis that that we face that brings out the sheer not just irrationality but the sheer brutality and callousness of contemporary capitalism. And these, uh, well, you call them clowns, but they're very dangerous clowns because they have power. Trump, uh, Bolsonaro, and Johnson really sum up that irrationality and, and callousness and so on. But I think that um, I can't resist also saying that this crisis um, helps to make more concrete some of the things that we've been talking about. So Leo um, raised the question about smashing the state. Now, I mean, you'd have to be, the, the state in contemporary capitalism is a complex thing you'd have to be a moron to say smash the National Health Service. It's something that we need and must defend and so, so on and so forth. But um, then they're the, the, um, the, you know, the focus of, you know, Len in as much as Leninism is about smashing the state, it's concerned with the repressive apparatuses of the state and the politicians and bureaucrats and capitalists whom they, whom they serve. And I mean, I think that this crisis illust illustrates, you know, the way in which the different kinds of solutions that one can have. One can have uh, solutions to a pandemic which are imposed from above in a highly incompetent and bureaucratic way and serving, you know, the imperatives of getting the economy back to work as quickly as possible and so on. Or you can have a solution in which people organize to defend the vulnerable um, against the pandemic and to do what's necessary to protect life until we can overcome this pandemic. And in a way, I mean, and we see elements of that, not strong enough, but in the kind of responses from below and the, you know, the strikes and so on that have taken place, the different kinds of workers' action that have taken place, we see glimpses of that. If that were further developed, that would be the beginning of dual power. You'd have two different solutions to the COVID-19 uh, crisis, one coming from above, serving the interests of capital, and the other coming from below and involving popular working class self-organization. Unfortunately, we've had only glimpses of the latter, but I think that, that illustrates um, the kind of soil out of which generally, genuinely revolutionary movements can, can emerge. And of course, this will be new, very different from how things were in the 19th or the 20th century. There's so many things that are different. But one of the things that the experience of the past few months um, has taught me is that certain things fundamentally don't change. You know, when I 
when we look at the experience of the pandemic, it's a bit like, although fortunately the death count isn't as high yet, living through either the Irish famine of the 1840s or the Great Bengal famine of the mid 1940s. The, 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 the way in which capitalism uh, can inflict collective disaster on vast numbers of people in a highly class determ determined way. So all sorts of things change, but certain things remain the same. And those continuing realities have to inform our strategies as well as an understanding of what has changed. Great, thank you so much. And yeah, I'm just gonna take the time to thank both of you so much. This has been a really, really great meeting. And I'm sure everyone has learned a lot and it's gonna provide a lot of thought. We have another meeting coming up on Wednesday from uh, people before profit health worker COVID activists. No return to unsafe workplaces and schools with the man that we've been talking about for the past hour and a half, Jeremy Corbyn, with a lot of other frontline health workers and teachers. It's gonna be a fantastic meeting, it's live as well. So please tune into that on Wednesday. And then next week on Saturday, same time as uh, we've done today, we have another meeting, uh, which is the COVID crisis resistance in the global south. We can have some, we will have some really, really great speakers from Africa, India, um, Ghana, sorry, and Algeria and India. It's gonna be a really, really great meeting. So please, please, we'll see you there. Um, I'm also just gonna take a little moment to talk about our bookshop, Bookmarks Bookshop. It's really important right now, I think as you all know, to support independent businesses and shops. Um, right now in this time of, of economic crisis. Um, and we've got some fantastic books. And I think right now is the best time to get your head stuck in a good socialist book. So please go to our website, we can get them sent out to you and please support us in this difficult time. Um, lastly, I just wanna really, really quickly talk to you about the Socialist Workers Party. I think if you've enjoyed this meeting, which I'm hoping that you have, and if you've been following us in most of our live meetings, you can see that we've got a lot of conversation going on. And what's so special about this party is that it's not just conversation, we take action. I think if you know we fight for peace and equality and injustice for everyone, and we are revolutionaries, so, we take action, we're not just talking about it. And I think if you have the same kind of ideas and you're, and you're willing to learn more, but also more importantly, if you wanna act and you wanna be part of the, of the movement, then please consider joining the Socialist Workers' Party. There'll be a link on how to join in the comments and we would love to have more of you. Um, I just wanna take another quick moment to talk about both Alex and Leo's um, Oh, just, just Leo's book, sorry. Um, we're gonna talk about Searching for Socialism, which I mentioned at the start, which is a great book that Leo has written. Please, please uh, get your hands on it. It won't be a mistake. And right now I think you've got a lot of time. So please try and go get that. Searching for Socialism, the project of the Labour New Left from Ben to Corbyn. And as I mentioned at the start, we've got the fantastic book by Alex, The Revolutionary Ideas of Karl Marx. This book will be really, really good in just getting you up to scratch with all of Marx's ideas. Uh, I read it recently myself. It's really great, so I would really recommend. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. Please go to Bookmarks, grab those two books and join the SWP if you feel like you've enjoyed this meeting. We are, yep, yeah, we're really, great to have more people uh, so that's it from me thank you but to both of our speakers for this fantastic meeting stay safe everyone stay socialist and we will see you next week <laughs>